Well, let's be honest. Oil was at minus $37 a barrel. So it was kind of funny when, when, you know, we were discussing the separation, you know, Kane was like, well, we'll waive any non-compete um, type issues, you know, because we had such a good partnership. Sure. And if you want to go raise your own fund, go raise your own fund. And I'm sitting there staring at minus $37 oil saying, well, guys, my opening position is I'll take a lifetime ban from the industry. Let's start there on my side. The uh, the thing I love about the the prep is I'm sitting here looking at this going, oh my god, I really am having a bad hair day. This is horrible. <laughs> You're well, gonna edit this out, right? We're we can gonna, we can edit the here. whole thing out. You know, we we could just make you look Perfect. like Frank Sinatra. Uh, it'll be fine. I like I like this uh, remote setup. You know, honestly, it's it's got a you got a nice little bar there. What percentage of guests are drinking before they come on? <laughs> Boy, back in the day when we started the podcast, there was a lot of booze flowing because I used to record. I used to record in this uh, studio down in Richmond, Texas. It was an old house. It was a guy's passion project, and he set up literally a world class recording studio down there. And what would happen is rappers would come down at like midnight, one in the morning, stoned off their tails. <laughs> And just go to town and rap all night. And this was kind of a saying. Had no idea this was happening at the end of my street in Richmond, Texas. But I probably recorded about the first 50 or 60 podcasts I did. The audio only ones. <laughs> I did that down there. And it always felt like we had a bottle of wine or two while we were uh, doing it. So this this thing's got to smell. Like, it's got to smell like... Uh... Like, it's got to be smelling like weed the second you walk into that studio. Uh, you know, he was pretty good at making people smoke out on the porch. But, <laughs> you know, he he texts periodically, and I'm kind of sworn to secrecy on this. But there were some rappers you've heard of that have been down there. And, and he used to give me a heads up. Hey, you might want to show up at 2 in the morning, you know. <laughs> and uh, so I'd, I'd wander down. Yeah, it was fun. It was uh, unfortunately... Unfortunately, they sold the lot that the house was on. It's going to become a Starbucks. Oh, so, uh, yeah, just just the way the world goes now. Exactly. That's so uh, now. What? Tell me what? Tell me what you're doing with this podcast thing. This I is think, uh, this is kind of cool. Yeah. So I, I think the uh, objective for me is a couple different things. One, it's it's very selfish. Like. Uh, I'd like to get better at whatever this game is. And so the only way to really do it is uh, instead of like watching other people do it or read, I just have to like do them. Right. Uh, so, so that's one. And number two is it feels like a podcast is a very uh, it's like a life hack into getting conversations with people you ordinarily wouldn't. So I like this conversation because we're going to have far more rapport, but uh, ordinarily it's real. It's much easier to get someone to sit down that would never have any interest in having lunch with you or a conversation with you uh, if you have a podcast. And then I think the third is it's another media piece of content for my audience coming from the newsletter. And so the newsletter seems to be working from an experiment perspective, but a lot of people don't like to read and a lot of people are consuming a lot of audio only content or podcasts. And so the thought is we're covering a lot of news coming out of various founders or companies, startups. What if we just sort of platform those same people that we're covering some news release about and have them come on and tell their story? So that's really so, the, the first reason. Okay, so I'm going to grade you. You're absolutely right on number one and number three. I love both of those things because – you know, with the power of the internet today, you can push this anywhere. Um, I've got a, uh, I've got a garbage crew, like literally take their shirts off, pick up garbage, driving around Seattle that supposedly listens to my podcast every Friday. And I wind up getting an email from them. They don't, they don't know a lot about uh, the energy business, God bless them, but they ask really good questions. Sure. Hey, what'd this guy mean by this? So that's kind of cool. Supposedly, 
uh, one of the nuclear submarines. The uh, the commander is call it forty five years old. He's got three years till retirement, full pension. He is a nuclear scientist. Wants to get into the nuclear energy business, and was talking to somebody and said, "We need an energy podcast to listen to." So I am being blasted at you know ten thousand feet below the sea or whatever, you know, uh, weekly. And so putting your thoughts down in this kind of format, audio, video, the distribution capabilities of the internet are amazing. So I agree with you on one and three. Two, you're not going to get a meeting with somebody that wouldn't go eat lunch with you. In fact, you'll kind of get the opposite. You'll get some crazies going, hey, I want to come on your podcast. (laughs) You'll get you'll get this, but I think what it will do is when you have somebody on your podcast, you'll have a really interesting co- conversation. It'll make the bonds tighter. Sure. So that's my take on your number. Your number two, you'll you'll wind up being better friends with folks uh, that come on. Well, I like it. You know, anything to strengthen our bond, Chuck, uh, would be phenomenal. So I'm gonna do a stab. Oh, I just I- felt like I got a hug. I felt like I, <laughs> let's see if I can. Do- we just hugged. That's so great. I, I know you you were pushing to do this in person, but I wanted to get it out there as soon as possible so I could get you back on a year from now, uh, sooner. Uh, so you know, I'll, I'll see you a week of nape. Uh, you know, half of that being sober, half of that probably not. Uh, but uh, I'm I'm looking forward to this exact episode. Call it a year from now. Uh, and, Perfect. And seeing what that sounds like. But I want to take a, a stab at your background first because for someone who's accomplished a lot. I feel like you 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 don't brag on yourself as much. We've talked about this. It's like, you know, generally podcast hosts are much better at being self-deprecating than they are being uh, sort of braggadocious. Uh, so I'm going to try to try to stake a stab at yours. So from what I can tell, like you completely grew up, you've never lived outside of the Houston area. You grew up uh, in Richmond. Uh, you went to school at Rice. Uh, you joined Stevens in investment banking as you know an analyst. Hold on, surgeon. real quick, real, real quick. Uh, spent spent about three and a half months in Austin doing a semester at the University of Texas Law School. Figured out that big thick book, tiny print, no pictures is not my jam, so I dropped out and uh, came back to Rice Business School. And then with Stevens, I spent one year in Dallas. But you're okay. Okay. you're good, correct good. so far. Okay, no, no. So let, let's go through. So when you you were in law school, like you applied, went to law school, and three months in, just said, "This isn't for me." Full scholarship. I had a full <laughs> ride from the University of Texas. Like Chuck, you just show up. And this sounds, uh, and this I sounds nuts. Like this doesn't sound like uh, th- this. Uh, you like the 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 fact that you obviously had a plan in undergrad. I assume uh, studied went there, full ride, everything. Three months doesn't feel like a long enough time horizon to be like, yeah, I'm out on this. But, you know, like, something had to have happened. As, a, as, a, as my ex-wife likes to say, yeah, maybe couldn't have we have made this decision two weeks earlier before I moved there? And I'm like, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> so you were so, to- I, so what I was a political science guy, always interested in politics. I managed five campaigns when I was an undergrad at Rice. I was going to the University of Texas Law School, and I was going to be governor of Texas. That that was the career path uh, and how to do it. And I just I think what actually happened is I just got burnt out by uh, by school. I probably needed a year off from school. That was one. And then number two. I was sitting in civil procedure class, and that's basically what are the rules of court? And we went through this court case where basically um, they put a rule in place, and I think it was the state of Louisiana, that said you could not repossess a car unless you got a court order to do it first. And that sounds really good, doesn't it? It's like, oh, yeah, that's fair and all that. So they put that in, in place, and then they had, you know, three months later, they looked at the data, and they were like 500 cases in 480 of the cases, the defendant showed up and said, yeah, I didn't make my payments. And the judge went, okay, go get the car back, you know, immediately. <laughs> so there were like 20 cases, about, about call it 
10 of them, the defendant didn't even show up. So, okay, boom. So there were like 10 cases left that just had an issue or two. Oh, we missed the payment. We did this. And it got worked out, you know, pretty quickly and all. But what had happened was, is it raised the cost of a car, particularly a used car, because that's where the financing happens, right? Lower end used car. It raised them about $400 because you basically knew if you sold a car yep. and you finance it, you were going to have to go to court to get this. And uh, being the, the young, idealistic, libertarian politician, I get called on that day. Chuck, what did you think of this court case? I said it's horrific. It's basically hurting poor people, hurting their opportunity. It's going to lead to more poor people uh, and all that. And the, the professor did what the professor is supposed to do, just rails on you. Because that's what they do. They take yeah. the opposite side. And, you know, so I'm sitting there bobbing, weaving, and it usually, and when you're getting cho- chosen, you go the whole hour, hour and a half. So I went toe to toe as best I could with all that. After class, I really expected my classmates to come up and go, oh man, good job, way to hang in there, do your best and all that. Man, people were calling me a Nazi because I think, I thought that somebody could just come and take your car away. And I was like, no, I just want cheaper cars. And so anyway, that really traumatized me. And I was talking to one of my best friends and I'm like going, man, this is just crazy. These people are nuts. And he goes, oh, and by the way, if you become a lawyer, they're going to be your friends for the rest of your life. And I was like, dude, I'm out. (laughs) Called called mom. I'm like, yeah, get dad on the phone. This is a biggie. This is a biggie. Hey, I'm dropping out of law school. And my mom was like, my baby has a conscience. Please come home. (laughs) That's kind of crazy. Uh, one, like the fact that you remember that so vividly is nuts to me uh, because uh, we're b- about the same age, Chuck. Uh, and, you know, I can't remember anything from college. So, you know, that, that's pretty nuts. You, you remember when you you remember when you drop out of law school. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the you, you sort of have that you kind of drop out. What is it? Nine, nine, 12 months. And your your viewpoint here is lawyers are unconscionable. So I'm going to go get an MBA because the business guys, you know, certainly uh, care about others a lot more. I, I think it was even maybe less than that. It was just a default in, I don't know what I want to do. I mean, sure. Rice is a great school. It's always yeah. in the U.S. News and World Top 20. Um, great at teaching you to think. Very, the education was amazing there. No practical skills. Sure. I used to joke. I used to joke, I got my education at Rice and then tried my vocational training at the University of Texas. Um, but at the end of the day, just defaulted back into business school because I didn't know what I wanted to do, figured out finance. And that was kind of when, okay, this is my jam. I want to be a banker. And then that's when I got to Stevens. So you go Stevens, you're there for what, uh, like almost a decade, something like that? Seven, eight years? Yeah, seven, seven years. And then- always. Yeah. Always wanted to do well, but not well enough to get promoted to Little Rock. Yeah. So that was my that was my that was my jam on that. So so the Little Rock opportunity comes up, and you're like, no, okay, now I'm going by side. So you're joining Kane. Uh, this is like 2000, 2001 ish era. Right, March and, 2001. Yeah. And they had not had an energy fund at that time. Is that right? Like this is they had energy. one. They okay. they had raised energy fund one in ninety nine and were in the process of raising energy fund two. Okay. So, so I was I was the second employee. Oh wow. Okay. And so you're there and you grow that over twenty years, uh, which is like insane, uh insane like sort of US energy renaissance during that time, primarily as a result of shale. And then uh, sort of public ousting-ish uh, from, from Kane, uh, which we don't have to go into or, you know. Oh, uh, I love that way. You public out. What did you say? Outing-ish? Ousting. <laughs> ousting. You know? Ousting-ish. Uh, yes. The, there we go. I, yeah. And, I was and, ousted. <laughs> that's right. That, that's, uh, you know, that's how I feel. And look, there's, there's a couple different camps, right? Which is you could go, you're at 811 Main. You could go down the street, get office space and say, I'm starting, you know, Chuck Yates Fund One. Uh, but you didn't do that. Um, you, well, you... let's be honest. Oil was at minus thirty-seven dollars <laughs> a barrel, so it was kind of funny when when you know we were discussing the separation. 
you know, Kane was like, well, we'll waive any non-compete um, type issues, you know, because we had such a good partnership. Sure. And if you want to go raise your own fund, go raise your own fund. And I'm sitting there staring at minus $37 oil saying, well, guys, my opening position is I'll take a lifetime ban from the industry. Let's start there on my <laughs> side. So, so you're, you you take a little bit of time uh, and then you you effectively start going into content creation almost instantly between Twitter. Uh, you know, you start uh, I think there was a series of like YouTube videos you made. Then you had like the podcast Then you started doing the work with, with Colin and Jake. Walk me through that. Was that something you wanted to do prior? And, you know, given your investment seat, you couldn't do that. Or was it just, hey, I'm bored. I have some time. Let me let me take a stab at this. And I'd, I'd love to put together a more coherent story sure. about that. But, you know, it was so the ex-wife uh, has asthma and we're in COVID, right? Yep. And I took it really seriously because the kids were going back and forth. That also meant I'm by myself in Richmond, Texas. Yep. And um, so there was a little issue of kind of going stir crazy there, um, number one. Number two... And this is, a, I gave a speech to the Wildcat, uh, the, the yeah. Petroleum Alliance of Oklahoma, their first time, uh, first dinner back after, uh, after COVID. And one of the things I said in there is every company needs to give an employee uh, three months off every two to three years, literally where they can't even see their emails. Mm -hmm. You truly need that break. Because the one thing that I noticed is literally 48 hours after getting fired and literally having no responsibility, I couldn't see my cane email, you know, all that, man, it was like this fog just lifted from me. And I could sit there and go, man, why in the hell were we doing that that way? We should have done it this way. The clarity it kind of gives you. And so kind of in part of that was you know, that hit me in the face was, man, we all bury our head in the sand as energy folks and everybody else on the planet is out leading with content. You know, you sure. go to Andreessen Horowitz's website, they're the biggest VC fund on the planet and they look like a media company. Hey, here's our podcast where we're talking about future gaming. Here's our white paper on the unbundling of LinkedIn, blah, 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 blah. And I just sat there and went, man, that would be really cool and it kind of combined with my best friend has always said this fish has has always said when people are like "Ooh, chuck what does he want to do when he grows up or what's he going to do after this and fish said since the day i met him he wants to be a game show host so <laughs> there was kind of there was kind of an element of that you so you're right I just, now. yeah i just started blowing up i, I started blowing up twitter and yeah. and kind of my personality in life has always been you just own something and be really self-deprecating about it. And you take the weapon out of somebody's hand, yeah. you know? And so instead of like drafting a story of Chuck is left to pursue other opportunities, it's like, nah, you fired me. It's good. Let's just, you know, I'm going to own that I got fired and I'm going to go talk about it. And uh, I'm going to make fun of myself a lot. And then nobody has a weapon they can use against you, you know? Sure. And so, you you gave that speech at uh, I missed that first one. The most recent one you did was along the same lines around content and trying to encourage employees at some of these big companies to put pump out some content. Um, and you certainly you sort of sh led by example on that front. What do you think? Do you think any differently than that talk? I forget what it was like a few few months ago now. Yeah, no, but I, I mean, we can, you and I should be hammering home this message every chance we, we get to, to people is I think what happens in a vacuum is the other side fills up. And so what I mean by that is we're not out telling our story. We're not showing how cool oil and gas is. We're not showing about the great things we do. We sit around in the echo chamber and we quote facts, figures, and reasons to each other, high five each other. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't change any one person's mind out there on the planet. And if we could figure out a way to connect on an emotional level with people outside, we might actually be able to win some battles out there and not have in effect the environmentalists, the anti-hydrocarbon people win every single mm -hmm. battle. And 
and kind of the the example I gave at the uh, Petroleum Alliance launch, and I'm going to give it here, is I just opened Zoom rooms. This was, I think, two years ago, just all summer. I said, hey, I'm going to be in a Zoom room from 10 to noon every day this week. And I was blasting this out on Twitter and LinkedIn. I said, just come join me if you're under 25 and you went into energy or you didn't go into energy. Mm -hmm. And it was great, man. I probably talked to 50 to 75 people that were just popping in. And the story that really nailed it home to me is a Canadian engineer calls me up and he goes, or he's on the Zoom room. He goes, Chuck, you know what it is? He goes, Sun, and I'll just use the name Suncor. Suncor would come to university. They'd send an old 55 year old white guy. I was a little offended because I am 55. Pretty pasty too, I might <laughs> add. But, but anyway, he's like, and the title would be extracting oil and gas. Sure. And 10 people would show up. 30 minutes into the hour presentation, six or seven people had left. And that was it. And he said that happened freshman, sophomore, and junior year. He said senior year, they sent a 27-year-old Indian engineer who had mm -hmm. uh, studied, uh, gone to college in India, had moved to Canada to get this job. And the title of the presentation was Utilizing AI to Image the Subsurface. And everybody went, wow, that sounds really cool. So 200 people show up for this presentation. And the guy's down there full of enthusiasm. His opening line was something to the effect of, holy crap, I've never talked to this many people in my life. And he starts running through a product demo and he's bouncing around. Supposedly by the end of the presentation, 400 people are in there and they stay for two hours afterwards and he talks to all of them. It was basically the yep. same presentation. Exactly. All this, all this young guy did was connect on an emotional level and talk about how cool it was sure. and, and, and the like. And so my point in telling that story is Suncor signed up one engineering hire, maybe two each year. That last year they got 25 or something yeah. ridiculous. We're not that far off. All we have to do is tell our stories. And when I was at that speech uh, at the Petroleum Alliance and I was talking about this, I basically got the question of, oh, yeah, but, you know, some employee is going to do something stupid and, and destroy everything. And I went back and I said, you know, we're trusting people with enough pressure that they could literally blow up a small town in Oklahoma, <laughs> you know. We're trusting them with that. I think we can trust them with an iPhone. And if you really think about it, if you have the right people, you have the right culture and you have the right training, you can trust people to document what they're doing. And I'll tell you this, there's a whole thing on TikTok of oil field workers and you know, Colin McClellan, CEO here of Digital Wildcatters, filmed a, uh, a video on just how a drill bit works. Yep. Like nothing super scientific. It got a million views in the first week. So yeah. so I think the more and more we do this, the more and more we do this as a, as a as an industry, the more people go, wow, that's pretty cool. I want to learn more about it. No, I, I think it's a good frame. So I, I think there there was really two takeaways from because I was there when you went through the lunch. And I think you said, you know, I won't do the Indian accent uh, because <laughs> And I and, and you know I said afterwards to you and Brooke I said go ahead and do it you know the one Indian guy in the room doesn't mind <laughs> I, my Indian accent is way too much watching The Simpsons what? so there's, there's I would be canceled tomorrow if I tried that so you can't fake well, me and do it <laughs> well definitely not for the podcast you come back to OKC for the lunch and I don't think it's going to be an issue it's not recorded anyway but uh, I think my takeaway was it's a two millimeter shift. Right. So it's, it's kind of like when you're hitting the golf ball, um, you know, two millimeters and, and that has a profound impact on what's going to be the end result. And that was the same thing with the Suncor example. Right. Which is more or less the exact same presentation. You had a speaker who was much younger, so easier to relate to, which is, hey, I'm in college. You are someone that I could be five, 10 years from now, you could see that path a little easier. And then two was you're just creating an example, which is far more relevant for today, right? Um, and it's gonna resonate with that audience. So I, th I think that two millimeter shift 
can be applied to a lot of stuff uh, when you're thinking about trying to recruit younger people. In fact, it was probably a lot cheaper for the organization, too, to send someone younger and get, get out there and yeah. do what might be uh, <laughs> relevant. For that, 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 that's, uh, that's exactly right. And I like the way you frame it, because the way I tried to say instead of the two millimeter shift was I said, if one person mm-hmm. will record something, post it on Instagram and six people watch it, that's six more people than we had yesterday. Right. You know, and and just the compounding effect of that, because um, we, you know, one of the things I've learned, and I joke that I'm a social media influencer. That's that's my that's my job now. You know, I'm You're a celebrity. You want to be when they grow up, right? Because the number one uh, sort of job is YouTuber or uh, influencer. Well, it was it was so great because the uh, the girlfriend and and the daughters all have the same reaction when somebody comes up and wants to take a selfie. It's like, oh, good god! You know, right. are you kidding me? Yeah. It's actually kind of fascinating, right? Like we talked about this a little bit, which is people who you've never met will listen to your podcast episodes. And I'm sure you feel the same way about other podcasts you listen to, uh, which is if you listen to enough of them, uh, they're like your friend. You like, I I think there's something interesting about podcasts, which is like, okay, generally listen to audio only. Uh, They're in my ear. I'm like driving somewhere or whatever it is. I've heard enough conversations where I feel like that person is my friend. I've never met this person. I've never interacted with this person, never interacted with them even via Twitter or something like that. Uh, But they feel like they're your friend. And I suspect that is why so many people come up to you and are like, Hey, I listen to your stuff. And like, you're my, you're my buddy now. It's like this weird social experiment we now have where we're friends with people that we've never met. Well, and, and that's kind of that's I'm, I'm writing a speech right now about how do we go recruit young people. And that's one of the key points I make in there is kids grew up today and they're just digitally native. Yep. They meet people. They meet people on Twitter. They don't know the person's name because they're anonymous. They interact sure. through direct messages. They interact online in front of everybody. And you literally build these close relationships. And you may never have met the person. It, it was funny. I was uh, going to New York with the girlfriend and she had some meetings she was going to go do. And she goes, what are you doing this afternoon? I said, well, I'm going to get a drink. And she goes, who with? And I go, it's a guy named Frankie Fourfingers. And she's like, you can't go get a drink with Frankie Four." I, she goes, who is he? And I have, I have no idea. Frankie Fourfingers. That's, and so we wound up meeting for a drink, had a delightful time. He or, you know, and I'm really good with anonymity on Twitter. I keep the secret. So he or she was delightful and, and we chatted and a prominent person. And, you know, it was uh, it was fun. But that is the norm with kids. It, I think that's the norm. Uh, you know, on EFT, I was actually shocked because I think the viewpoint for a lot of people who aren't on Twitter or on EFT uh, which like I have sort of uh, avoided a lot of that in the last year and a half or so uh, is uh, the, the viewpoint is these are all people who are really young, uh, but it's actually quite the opposite. Like it's actually really um, a lot of really seasoned people in the industry that are using an anonymous handle handle in my like short period of time uh, messaging there. Uh, and I've always been shocked uh, to see that actually. Uh, that was like pretty frame breaking for me. I've, I've had a, uh, I've had a couple of uh, dinners where I show up and go, no fucking way. Really? Yep. It's you. <laughs> and uh, you get the, yeah, it's me. And I'm like, man, we've been, we've been doing direct messages yep. forever. Yeah. Yep. No, that's that's right. So um, one topic that we talked about uh, a while back, which is in line with your content idea, was the concept of a chief content officer at a private equity fund. So obviously you you have a, a longstanding understanding of how to build a very good fund over the last 20 years. But it feels like from your point of view for the next, call it decade or two, uh, energy private equity ought to have a chief content officer. What do you think that looks like? So this is what's so crazy is you'll you'll it's almost like energy private equity has isolated itself from the whole rest of the world 
and you go have you go have a beer dinner lunch with anyone in energy private equity and how is it oh man fundraising's so hard it's so horrible you know we had for the longest time we had the green and the red problem a lot of losses environmental stuff is the green performance has been a lot better because prices have come back so maybe the red issue is fading but we still have the green issue and it's just tough there's not any money available and I'm always like, well, show me your content. And they're like, oh, we can't. We no, we can't put any content out there. People will criticize us. And then I go, okay. And I and I'm not really a very smart guy, but I do go, okay, who's who's the biggest out there? And you go look at Carlisle, KKR, and I'm gonna get you know, of these big guys, three out of the four of them, you pull up their websites and they look like media companies. Yeah. You know? And and they're all they're all talking content. And what I mean by content is it can be a white paper. It can be a podcast. It can be a video clip. It can be in effect, many movies, whatever mm-hmm. the case may be. And if, and, and, and if you make this and it's authentic and it's real, cause man, people today can sniff through it. Yep. If you write a script and you get, posed here and you put filters on everybody's like i'm not watching that stuff if you get if you get real with folks and they can tell it's it's truly you and i got a great stat for you in just a second that that proves this point then if you're perceived as a thought leader if you're perceived as someone that knows what's going on if you're perceived i i think you have to be vulnerable too i think people have to go okay that's a real person i'm going to trust them and the like you literally can turn your your life today from outbounds of let's put a book together and let's go to New York and fundraise with 10 different meetings to people reaching out to you and say, hey, I want to learn more about this, yep. you know, and energy private equity hasn't done it. I will give them this. I will give them credit for this. Three years ago, they were like, why in God's name are you doing a podcast? And will you please stop telling people how management fees are, are calculated? <laughs> I said, you know, hey, whatever. And then, you know, kind of two years ago, it was, hey, dude, I listened to that podcast you did. That was really good. I like that. I learned something, blah, blah, blah. About a year ago, it got into, hey, why don't we go grab a beer and chat about this stuff? And I would say in the last six months, I've talked to a lot of people in the industry that are like, okay, get serious here. How would you actually do this? And like with most things, energy, we're probably about 10 years behind the rest of the world in doing this. And let me throw kind of one thing out uh, on uh, on content that I think is really important. And it comes to this whole concept of you got to be genuine, you got to be authentic. Name the three most trusted news sources in America. Put you on the spot here. It's a good question. I mean, trusted news sources, I don't, you know, my suspicion is America probably thinks they're like, uh, they're probably like the big three news channels. I don't probably agree with that, but that's probably what this stat is. Okay, so you're going there. Actually, if you look at the three most trusted news sources in America, and this is not in order, they're all, sure. they all rank about the same. Oprah Winfrey, Howard Stern, and Joe Rogan. Wow, okay. Well, that- I mean, and, you know, and, and everybody in the energy business goes, oh my God, you can't say that, you'll be canceled. Howard Stern has said everything horrifically. Oh, I mean, that's right. Incredibly that's well, tr- that's incredibly right. well trusted because he's authentic. He's real. That's who he is. Also, as good an interviewer as we we've got, sure. he gets celebrities to tell you stuff that they don't tell to anyone else. Same thing with Rogan. Rogan's very thoughtful, uh, smart guy, very authentic. Tells you what he's thinking and things. I mean, and obviously he's done all his jokes that should theoretically get people canceled, but they don't. I mean, Oprah, Oprah is a little bit of a, uh, of a different, uh, person, but at the same time, I mean, she publicly talked about losing her virginity at 12 years old so she could get a popsicle. I mean, so that's not Walter Cronkite. But at the same time, because they're authentic, they've garnered trust with uh with their audience and that's why they rank you know in the top three and so my my anybody thinking about content and using that as a form of leverage to create inbounds for yourself you got to be real 
Yeah. You got to be real because if you're not and, – and what's interesting is what's real for me is not what's real for you. Sure. I mean, I, I'm self-deprecating. I've had a lot of therapy. I'm actually happy to share all that kind of stuff because I don't want you to make the mistake I've made. I already paid the price. Don't want you to deal with it. But that may not be you, you know. Yeah. Other people are like, no, I'm the funny guy. I'm the really, really smart, thoughtful guy. It's got to be authentic. It's got to be you because people see through it. Yeah, That's I my mean, soapbox. <laughs> I'm off my soapbox now. I think the concept makes all the sense in the world, right, which is if you're in the investment business, you have a handful of stakeholders, right? One is you have founders or management teams you want to attract. Um, what percentage of management teams were you chasing? relative to inbounds when yeah you- no that that no that that was uh that was uh that was right because most management teams we were chasing because if you think about yeah. energy private equity um i think they they talk about the uh the 97 firms because it was like yeah. quantum NCAP moved over doing private equity as opposed to MES and 90. Yep. Everybody kind of in the those late 90s, NGP had, had started around uh, around there. And, you know, Kane had started with Bob Sanat sitting in Los Angeles saying, if someone's so desperate, they'll come to Los Angeles to see me. I'm going to put really harsh terms in front of them. And if I get them, great. If I don't, sure. you know, I'll go yeah. to the beach club or whatever. And when we opened the Houston office and started having to compete every day with NGP, NCAP, and the like, uh, we were chasing. I mean, we were yep. definitely behind, we were definitely behind. And two, that was part of the hoodie thing. Um, I mean, one, it's just my personality. I'd rather wear a hoodie than a suit any day. But we, I and I think Bob Sanat. Uh, at some point really got this to to his credit. There was some method to the madness in that if you want somebody to wear a suit and tie to your board meeting, why wouldn't you choose Quantum, NCAP, NGP? If you want kind of a weirdo whose business partner, Mike Hines, is a great reservoir engineer, if you want those guys in your board meeting and generally speaking would be more user friendly, I mean, we said no when we had to say no, but at the end of the day, well, actually, one of the greatest quotes I ever said, and I'll, I'll name the CEO because I love the dude to death. Barry Mullinex used to call yep. from Panther, and he would beat me up all the time. Chuck, we need to do this, blah, 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 blah. And I told him one time, I said, hey, Barry, you know, every time I say no, it's just that much easier next time. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so a little bit of kind of the caricature of Chuck Yates was to give us a little bit of a leg up to, to chase those teams. Eventually then you get into the game of, you just need to keep the teams you like, Yeah, you know? So it's about, re- and, and then t- towards later in life, we were getting inbounds of, Hey, we heard great things about you about this. Yeah. We think you'd really fit. So yeah, mm-hmm. no, it was interesting. Yeah, someone said the other day that you were uh, a micro celebrity. I thought that was a, a fascinating a term, which is uh, – I hope you find that flattering. I think they meant it in a flattering way. But what I think is this concept where, of known well versus well-known. So, for example, I like Tom Cruise is uh, very well-known. Like everyone knows who Tom Cruise is. However, I couldn't tell you three things about his personality or what he's into and what he's not. Like I just can't do that. I, I'm not sure – I've watched enough interviews or whatever, but you're known well. And so I think when you walk me through that chief content officer concept, I thought that was the exact same, you know, sort of unique edge, which is if I'm an investor, I don't necessarily need to be well known. Uh, that that's actually irrelevant. I don't need everyone to know my name. I just need the right audience to know me very well. Here's what I'm willing to invest in. Here's how I do it. Here's what I won't invest in. And that sort of resonates with three different stakeholders, right? And and have some intensity about it. I.e., they really, really like me. Yeah, I'll take I'll take twenty management teams that love me if the other five hundred hate me. You have to piss some people off. Uh or or you're not really, you know, drawing some hard line, right? Um and 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 that's just kind of how that goes. And so you have your sort of LP stakeholders, which you're trying to attract people who agree with your sort of 
thesis or what your fir- firm is about. You have founders and management teams that you're chasing, not the ones that are coming in because they just need capital, for example. And then you're also trying to attract the best investment professionals, right? So you're also trying to attract in a lot of ways, okay, great. If I'm uh, a rock star investment banking analyst at Goldman in my second year and I have my pick of the litter of funds, uh, which is the one that I align with, not just the one who you know sort of pays me the most or, or whatever the case may be. Um, no, it's always about the money. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, so – one of the things that we sort of talked about was if you were uh, – like if we sort of went back in time and you were like 25 again, either on the investment professional side or on the founder side, what would you be thinking about? What are the business plans, opportunities, markets that you'd be kind of excited about? So so kind of – I'm going to – pull something back in, you know, we were talking about this speech I'm going to give and how do we recruit young people. And some of the things I've noticed about young people hanging around being this celebrity, micro celebrity, I'm I'm so glad. I'm so glad you were, you were not making any sort of reference to any (laughs) body part when you said micro there. I I was like, please don't let him say that. No, I like micro celebrity. But one of the things I've noticed about quote unquote, the kids, we talked about being digitally native. We talk, or I, I've seen they're very, very collaborative. Kids, kids today like to work together. I'll give a quick story about my daughter, Sarah. Mm-hmm. She was eight years old. Her soccer team was up eight to nothing in a game. She went and grabbed the ball. And my daughter, Sarah, will run the world one day. We don't know if for good or for evil, but we do know she's going to run the world. She grabs the ball and she's marching down towards the goal. And the the ref is, you know, another dad. And he's like, hey, Sarah, can I get the ball? And she said, no. And he looked at me and I'm like, dude, I don't know. Well, anyway, Sarah went and put the ball in front of the goal and had the other team line up. And they all took turns scoring goals, the other team. And all the girls were just cheering and hugging because everybody was getting a goal. And there was a dad that kind of wanted to stop it. And everybody's like, dude, they're eight. You know, we're not, <laughs> we're not playing professional soccer, but you know, Sarah came off and said, well, I wanted them to have some goals too. And, you know, and they, and, and I tell that funny story because kids are very, very collaborative today. The other thing about them too, is their fulfillment comes from way more than just a paycheck. Yep. You know, back, back, I think when I was young, your sense of self-worth as a man was how big is my paycheck, whose name is on the business card, and maybe the achievements of my son playing football. And that was it. And kids today don't. So so actually, you know, you asked me what I would be doing as a, as a young person is I actually like the fact that kids kind of think that way. And so, you know, what would I be doing? Go find something you love, Yeah. you know? I mean, totally find something you love, get into it. Cause like literally there are people today living in their mother's basement that figure out they like rental storage units and they start writing about it every day. Mm -hmm. They start studying the industry. They're talking to people, they're quoting rates and stuff. 10 years later, they've got a $2 billion fund investing in this. That's kind of this power of everything we've been talking about content being a thought leader, turning your life from, from outbounds to, to inbounds. So go find something you love, study the hell out of it, push content out. And, you know, at the end of the day, uh, believe it or not, and this is going to, you're going to laugh at this, but I would love to tell my 25 year old self, dude, don't worry about what other people think. Yep. You you just shouldn't. Life's so short. And the other thing I will say to kids today that I truly, truly believe, and this is not meant to be condescending. This is not meant to in any way being dismissive of the anxiety you're feeling. Everybody that's 22 years old has just tons of anxiety. I promise you this at age 55, I have no idea what I was anxious about when I was 22. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean it's not real for you, but I promise you, it goes away. It goes away. So, you know, and I know you want kind of a kind of more specific. So I'll I'll give you one. A problem I see right now, but I don't have a good solution for it Mm -hmm. is 1950 to 2000. 
the usage of electricity in America went up about 15x. We created a lot of cool stuff that ran off electricity. Everything from refrigerators, air conditioning, the computer, etc. You know, we just had all this, boom, a lot more electricity, right? 2000 to about today, power usage, electricity usage hadn't really grown much. It's That's been flat. pretty yeah. flat. It's been flat. And what happened during that last kind of 20-ish years was really the, the machines got a lot more efficient. Yeah. Yep. Lighting has become amazingly efficient. I think we're we're using over the last decade 10x the computing power up in the cloud, and we're only using 10% more electricity to power it. The right. machines have just gotten so that that game's done. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think uh, the head of MISO was on Maynard Holt's podcast. He was talking about we used to have 15% excess generating capacity. Now we're lucky if we got two. We've all seen the problems with ERCOT. For all the, the, the griping about ERCOT, it's just a leading indicator. ERCOT happens first and everybody else catches catches up on it. You talk to Elon Musk, I think he's at 3x the power by 2045. Goldman Sachs, I think, is at 2.5. McKinsey's at 2x. I think even PG&E's at 1.7x. Bottom line is we're going to need a whole lot more power. And when I sit there and look at it as an energy guy, Five guys in a rusty pickup truck doubled production yep. of oil in America because we gripe, oh, it's so hard to drill. The government's so bad. No, it's not. You can go drill a well in Texas in five days, you know. Far and easier than any of these renewable projects. Uh, like it's Totally, just, and you just – It's counterintuitive. You just put a tank out there. Put the That's oil right. in the tank. You can put it in a truck. It may cost money, but you can get anywhere. We can't do that with electricity. No. Electricity is generation then you got to have transmission. It's got to be all in sync. The grid has literally moving moving pieces to it. So this is a really, really, really hard problem. And I've been thinking a lot about it, but I'm not sure how you make money out of that. But boy, the person that solves that is going to be a billionaire. It's an interesting thought, right? Because uh, over the last 20 years, we continue to grow oil and gas production. That That's clear. Like, you know, but if electricity in the United States has been relatively flat and it's not permissionless, like you said, I think the example you gave of five guys in a pickup truck is a really good one. You need a big checkbook in oil and gas. I think that's like the barrier of entry outside of like knowledge. But the fact that there were funds that were like, oh, OK, like I like your business plan. Here's one hundred million dollars. Go drill up a bunch of oil and gas wells and like hopefully we make money on this business plan. You don't need permission from anyone else outside of, okay, we went and got the leases. We went and got the mineral owners. The permits are really easy to get. You go play that exact same tape in uh, power gen, wherever you play in that stack, it's far harder. It's not permissionless, right? You need to make it all, all of the pieces need to be there. And you're like, okay, I, I, I'm lucky. I'm the lucky one who gets to put this little last piece here and we can generate a return. Really? really hard to do uh well and it's and it's it's i like it that i like your your term of permissionless because i think that's a really good way of putting it because you know transmission lines i mean they're 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 lines that were permitted or were starting the permitted process 20 years ago mm -hmm. and still haven't gotten permitted because there's that's a snail right. darter here snail darter there and so i mean it's there are multiple stages of permission. You know, it's like mom, dad, grandma, uncle, and aunt. This isn't the, hey, dad, mom said it was all right. Mom, dad said it was all right. You can't do that in electricity. And what's really tough uh, for, I think, most people is if you come from a frame of oil and gas and then you start looking at, like, renewable-type projects, we universally hate them. And the reason why is we're used to taking a lot of risk but also potentially receiving a commiserate reward. Like we know there's goose egg risk on certain business plans, but there's also four or five X risk. Like there's a way to sort of make a portfolio that works. When I look at a lot of this, you know, sort of power renewables, whatever, and I'm lumping a lot of categories together, but the simplifying assumption is 80% of the time you're like, whoa, we're actually taking quite a bit of risk here. And there is just no return. Like in, when, when your Excel model shows you a single digit return, uh, that's really bad because the Excel model is usually, you know, 
four X higher than what the actual is, right? Uh, so uh, if the Excel math doesn't look very good, there's just no way you can touch it. Now, if you were not spoiled by coming from the oil and gas industry and looking at those returns, uh, or at least those base case returns, um, then you have a different frame of reference. But when your frame of reference is, I used to have five guys and we could go drill wells and here's our band of outcomes. And we don't need to rely on a lot of other outside factors to be successful other than the price of oil and that gas, uh, which is just like a big if. Here you're like, I need 12 other things to go my way and all these big companies to play ball with me. It gets really challenging. Well, it was really interesting. I had um, a fellow on the podcast caught two or three years ago, um, Robert Smith. I don't know yep. if you ever met him. He he, uh, he worked for John Donovan. And I always had to say, not the guy from The Cure, young finance guy. But he talked about all these, uh, all these uh, renewable projects being it's so dependent on interest rates yeah. and they only work today because interest is in effect free. Yeah. And uh, yeah, at eight and 9%, that's a whole different game. And, and he was right about that. And so as the investor quantifying your risk, I wonder how many of those investment memos said risk number one is the fed. Yep. No, that, you know, work, I think you're seeing the outcome <laughs> today, right? So Look, there's a lot of schadenfreude uh, in our industry from, from stuff, which I, I don't think is necessarily right, but it is what it is. We're, we're human beings, right? So we have to pick teams. And so a lot of the, like, call it offshore wind projects have all been scrapped or, like, you know, they haven't worked out or people have pulled out of them. And it's almost, like, obvious, right? Because if you agreed to these projects five years ago at a certain cost structure and a certain interest rate, and now you're looking at them today, they look horrible, right? Because... You know, inflation has made the cost structure go up 50%, let's say, and interest rates are much higher, right? So, like, your rents haven't changed either. Uh, and these are, like, utility sort of projects ultimately, right? So you're sort of beholden to uh, consumers saying, hey, I don't want to pay more money. Uh, back, to your, back to your permission thing, the PUC right. sitting there saying, you have to have my permission to charge the consumers yeah. more. Yeah. Right. Well, and that's it's crazy. Deal was cut five years ago. Right. So obviously yeah. it's not going to work today. Right. Any logical business person would be like, OK, we cut a deal five years ago. Here's what here was the cost. Here's what you were going to pay me. And here was the interest rate. Well, the interest rate is now five X higher. Uh, the costs are 50 to 75 percent higher. And I'm not going to get paid any differently. And oh, by the way, I was going to generate a 12 percent return anyway. Uh, originally, it's sort of obvious that 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 project is going to get scrapped. Right. And so for me, the challenge has been what are projects uh, within this category that are, are still economic today? Like, I think the sustainability thing, the ultimate thing is it needs to be sustainable from a capitalist perspective. Otherwise, it's just not going to happen, right? And right. I think there are segments of it that are super interesting, but it is challenging today. Uh, it is challenging. And the lower that nat gas and uh, oil are, it's actually even harder, right? Because you're competing right. against the – like, it's actually sort of strange, right? Which is, you know, this stuff is interesting when oil is $150 or not gas is $7. Because you're like, oh, I'm going to create this competing technology. Uh, but it is Im impossible uh, to compete with these commodities today because they're effectively free. So, so one thing along those lines that I've learned about the business that I think is really important and – I wish my 22 year old self knew this is if you think about energy, if we were starting from scratch, the, the energy delivery system would look nothing like it looks today. Right. And the thing you have to realize is the energy delivery system that we have today has been paid for. Yeah. So things that utilize the existing technology, or the existing infrastructure generally have that lower marginal cost, mm -hmm. i.e. because the last barrel, the last molecule, whatever. And you need to think through technologies that utilize that as opposed to scratch. You know, yeah. hey, we're going to just run the world on hydrogen. Okay, that's great. But we got to think about what pipelines already built can we use for that, you know, and, and the like. And I think that 
I think that gets lost on so many people outside of Houston, Texas. Well, we'll just, you know, we'll just put windmills here and you're like, okay, that's 250 miles of transmission lines, you know? Yep. Yeah, you, you really have to think of, of energy like that. And I wish that that's the the one kind of disappointing thing you have about the world. You wish you could have those thoughtful conversations about that instead of just demagogue, being demagogued about it. Because at the end of the day, for all the people that are going to die in five years, according to Greta, because of global warming, people die today when there's not enough fertilizer. People die today when... There's not enough heating or, or uh, heating is expensive in the winter. And so it, it really thinking through, okay, you got this big, huge jigsaw puzzle mm. or this big, huge water balloon. How do we get stuff that works inside it? We need to be way more thoughtful on because at the end of the day, we just don't have that much money. Not yeah, unlimited. That's right. I mean, look, uh, I think there's been this giant dividend that has more or less been paid uh, by the U.S. shale gas industry, right? That has powered a lot. I tweet of- out, I tweet out all the time that uh, Amazon and their vans ought to pay to plug all the wells. They're the ones that benefited <laughs> from it. Well, I mean, look, it, it, you know, there, there's an element of that. I, I think it's phenomenal. Like cheap nat gas in this country is incredibly flourishing for everybody right uh it's un, you know it's not great if you want to be a shareholder of some of these companies and you're like hey like yeah two bucks is a little cheap can we go to three uh, unfortunately there's no yeah you know, like they can't pass that on uh but it's a huge dividend to everybody right uh we can stay warm whenever it's cold outside and it doesn't break the bank relatively speaking and on an inflation adjusted basis like this stuff is free compared to 20 years ago, which was kind of nuts. Yeah. And we can uh, build stuff. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So when you think about, um, let's assume you were in your investment seat again. Uh, and if I, if I sort of give a broad characterization, let's say you're not a cane, but you're at an equivalent or something. Now all of these guys have raised some sort of transition-related fund, sustainable infrastructure, you know, areas where oil and gas companies can sort of play in transition are there any like themes or sort of management teams you'd be looking for like how how would you think through deploying capital and what is sort of a new category let's say for you historically yeah and and that that's really interesting because in effect i've been in that dynamic right Right. for the last three three and a half years i theoretically could have gone and started my own fund and you know what since i actually didn't try and failed I'll hold, I'll hold my belief that I could actually have gotten it done. You know, the, the issue I have is, is when I look at these new businesses and these new opportunities, it just always comes back to a government subsidy of some yep. sort. Yep. And that's just, you know, that's just always scared me in one sure. uh, way, shape or form because the government that gives, uh, the government that gives can take away. I know some people that have done a really good job of finding finding niches that actually make money. Mm-hmm. I just haven't been able to, I haven't been able, you know, I kind of sit there and I look at the, the Merck and I go, gosh, um, which of these going to make money? Haven't really, haven't really seen that. Um, and then, um, you know, when you look at oil and gas, I don't even know how to tell anybody to make money in oil and gas these days. I mean, you know, it seems like we know where all the acreage is. Mm-hmm. It seems like it's fairly priced and, and, uh, all that. The one thing I will say is somebody's going to figure it out and make a lot of money. They really are. This is just a big, huge, massive industry. If you spend enough time focused on some point of it, you can always make it more efficient and you can extract value from yourself to do it. So where I didn't give anybody an answer, I would also tell every kid on the planet, you ought to come study energy. It's big. It's huge. It's not going away. We burn more wood today than we ever have in the history of the planet for fuel. We've never had a transition except maybe away from whale blubber. And... uh <laughs> But we're, we're burning more coal today than we've ever burned before. This is a big, huge, massive opportunity. There are going to be a lot of ways to, uh, to, to make money here if you study it with fresh eyes. Um, 
and then come on the podcast and tell me about it, you know? Sure. Well, okay, good. I know we're coming up on time. Is there anything you want to want to share on uh, what you're working on? Uh, what what sort of folks you want connecting with you, and then how to best get in front of you? You know, I think uh, I think you know I, uh, my cell phone's on LinkedIn. My <laughs> direct messages are open, so feel free to call, text, whatever. If I don't want to talk to you, I just won't respond. You know. Has always been um, so. No, people I like hearing from. I I didn't think I was gonna relish being the old guy because I was always the youngest guy in every meeting, you know. And then at some point, I think it was a uh, Silver Hill. We had our first board meeting with those guys. I looked around and my partner Mike Hines wasn't in the meeting with me. I went, "Wow, I'm the old guy." Um, but I really relish being the old guy, so I'm happy to. I'm always happy to tell you what I think about stuff. I'm wrong a whole bunch. Uh, that's kind of number one. Number two, uh, I'd love everybody to go check out Digital Wildcatters. Um, I think everybody kind of knows who it is. I, I come into the office every day here, even though I'm not an employee, just because I figure that's better than day drinking at my house. Right. That, would, that wouldn't work. end well. But uh, yeah, so at, at uh, Digital Wildcatters, we publish 10 podcasts. We have live events. Our energy tech nights are great. It's kind of WWE meets yep. Shark Tank. Uh, we have a really cool Bitcoin mining conference for the energy business, specifically for oil and gas folks. Um, and then we've got a knowledge sharing app, Collide, that we're really excited about. We're To say we've launched a beta version is probably too strong, but the beta version is coming soon. We're getting a lot of good feedback. It's going to be cool. It's going to be a knowledge share. Mm -hmm. So you're going to be able to go there, talk to peers, Right now, you do that on Twitter, LinkedIn, and that conversation you had about what drill bit to use was great, and it goes away. You can't find it again. Those conversations are going to be stored, indexed, searchable, so you can do that. We've got a we've got an AI-driven search engine for a lot of our proprietary content as well as others. So think of kind of the Google for the energy business. It's really cool. We've got a jobs board on it. And so, you know, the goal is hopefully in five years from now, every energy professional, whether it's renewables, oil and gas, uh, is on Collide. And we're all just geeking out about energy. And uh, hopefully the whole world will share in it and feel better about energy. Or maybe it'll just be the biggest echo chamber on the planet. And I can yeah. go from, from micro to semi-celebrity. Semi. Can I do that? I'm I'm excited about what you guys are working on. Uh, I think the industry is better off that you guys are out there, even if even if you ever publish or Colin or Jake publishes a tweet and then someone doesn't agree with. I'm 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 grateful you guys are out there doing what you're doing. Um, and I think if you put uh, the time horizon even longer than five years, and you sort of think you're in the first inning of your content library today, and that's going to compound over the next decade or two. I think it's going to be insane uh, what's going to be in there. And for example, like I think it's it's kind of crazy to me that whatever was being done 10 or 20 years ago in our industry, it, it's just not documented or searchable or easy to, lost. to sort of go through. It's, it's a more or less loss. Like the effort required to make it ascertainable is just way too high. No one's going to do it. And so now one of the greatest one of the greatest board meetings ever. Uh, we were talking about drilling a vertical well, yep. and the 28-year-old <laughs> drilling engineer who had drilled 750 wells in his career yep. was looking puzzled. And Mike Hines goes, what's the matter? And he goes, well, I've never actually drilled a vertical well. I've only drilled horizontal. And Mike was like, same thing. You get to a point and then just stop. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but it's crazy. I mean, people cannot drill traditional straight nope. holes. No. God, God forbid they deviate a little. Oh That's my right. gosh. Right. Yeah. So, well, Hey, one last, one last thing, if I can get back up on my soapbox, because I think this yep. is the most important uh, thing I can say to people. And I truly, truly mean this a lot. We have been through craziness over the last five years. I mean, we have seen oil go to minus 37. We saw what half the industry get fired. We saw yeah. pay cuts. More we did all that. It's, yeah more consolidation it it's been just crazy look at the end of the day we all have mental health problems we just do and i'm number one on that i'm going to see my therapist every friday like i do 
Shame hates words. So when you're feeling bad, the only way you can get rid of that is to talk to somebody else. And it sucks, particularly for men. We're just not wired this way because we fix things um, and all. But I will tell you that 99% of the time, the person you choose to tell what you're feeling, what you're going through, why you feel so bad will counter with, hey, man, me too. I, uh, I had this going on. And we just have to do that, folks. We really do. It's too stressful a time not to do it. My DMs are always open, happy to take calls at, at three in the morning, but you're not in this alone. And uh, it's not at the end. Of, it's not the end of the world if a bunch of guys share our feelings with each other and hug each other. It's really not. No, for sure. I, uh, I appreciate you putting that plug and I think it's really well said. And my, my hope is, um, you know, on, on that note, I, I think, you're generally calling folks and asking for advice is almost like the advice uh, you would give yourself. You just need someone else to give it to you or you need to give it to somebody else to recognize it. So I, I appreciate you sharing that too. That's, that's a, that's a great way of saying it. Cause a lot of times when I'm talking to somebody, I say, what would you tell your best friend? And they always say, Oh, just get over it, dude. Move on. I'm like, all right, there we go. There you go. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Well, Chuck, I'll catch you in a week or two and then I will, uh, I'll, I think I see Colin and Jake tonight. So uh, I'll tell him he said, hey. And I'll, I will tell him you were Johnny on the spot uh, with your phone. There call we go. On Collide, yeah. There we go. Hey, appreciate you having me on. I look forward to a year from now when we do it again. Absolutely. Good to see you. Take care. See you.